I am Dr. Tasha Browning, a trauma therapist, and this is The Trauma Perspective. In this podcast, we will discuss various topics surrounding mental health, trauma work, trauma healing, and explore the lived experiences of trauma survivors. Be warned, trauma is a dirty topic. It is thick with hurt, and it reveals some of the ugliest sides of human existence. These discussions may not be appropriate for all listeners. So take a breath, stay present, and let's discuss the trauma perspective. Thank you for joining me on The Trauma Perspective. Um, This is the episode about the insurrection. I mean, what happens when fear is weaponized? And this is definitely an episode that I've struggled with, um, given my experience over the last few weeks um, of having been called to the Capitol to do work, trauma work, in regards to this incident. I kind of struggled back and forth with doing this podcast and you know actually right before um, I went to DC I I did another rendition of this and um, as soon as I got there um, within the first day I knew that I was going to have to re-record this and and think about this all over again from many different um, angles and I was going to have to really maybe process some of my own feelings Um, before sitting down and um, trying to have some type of discussion about this. The other half of this is that a lot of the um, repercussions of these events are still going on. And I even tried to wait until after the trials and things to um, try to give a little bit of distance between the event and and me and the conversation. But, you know, I kind of started to feel like that maybe this is something that's going to go on for, um, you know, longer then, you know, I can put a date on. Um, So to have this conversation now, I think is is something that might be needed because there needs to be a mental health perspective, especially a trauma perspective put on the events of that day. And then also what led up to the events of that day over the last four years. And, you know, um, I'm only one therapist with one um, perspective on this event. So I will do the best that I can. But, you know, I would not be who I am um, if I don't address this. So as I'm recording this, um, I'm, I'm looking at this from, and I'm feeling this from two different angles. One was my original angle in the original podcast when I discussed secondary trauma and actually being a pertinent, a person who is witnessing it, you know, taking place on, on TV and what that feels like and what vicarious trauma is and what, Um, you know, what research has said from 9-11 and on the effects that people have watching events like this on TV and then, um, you know, social media and how that influences, you know, um, the the reoccurrence and the impact of secondary trauma and the constant re-traumatization of things because of events like this. And, And so that podcast was great, right? It was very, you know, mental health. It was very, um, straight in a straight line with, what was taking place during that time on TV and in the country and what we knew about the events and the news and all that kind of stuff. And, and then I get a call, I get a call to have a life changing experience. I get a call that seems almost like, um, universally, um, the accumulation of many years of study and research and effort and time and love put into understanding trauma, understanding crisis and working with people in this area and then also working with organizations and and working in workplace crisis and events. And I get this call to come to DC, right? An opportunity, life-changing, but sad and exciting, but also so sad. And so of course I take the opportunity because this is what I'm trained for, right? I'm trained to be a therapist and to be at service. I choose that. I choose to be at service to people and to humanity. So I go and 
when you do this type of work, especially on site um, crisis work, um, you, you, you start to learn how to be ready for anything within 24 hours, sometimes within four hours to hit the road. And that's one of the things I specialize in is being ready to hit the road in a short period of time to go handle a crisis. And um, so I did that. You know, I had my bags packed. Luckily, I stopped and got some boots <laughs> before getting to D.C. I'm a Florida girl and, you know, we, we don't wear winter boots. We don't got winter boots. So that's one good decision I made. You know, I got some boots and I, I hit the road to go to D.C. and and see what this new opportunity and this new um, challenge is going to be and how I can positively impact humanity and, and, and work for the greater good and support people who are in need. And I, I arrive um, to find out that, of course, I would be at the Capitol and I would be um, working with the events surrounding that day from a mental health perspective, from a trauma perspective, and we would be supporting the Capitol Police. And that was great. I was completely, you know, I'm, I'm completely comfortable with working this with uh, law enforcement, that population, you know, uh, immediately, because I, I'm, you know, I tend to be overprepared in life, um, you know, pull a couple trauma books with me and I'm, you know, getting my assignments and I'm bringing my trauma books with me just in case there's anything I want to scan through, uh, you know, in between sessions and looking through my phone and looking, you know, reacquainting myself with some other law enforcement um, journal articles that maybe I haven't read yet. And just kind of scanning through differences between, you know, like firefighters and and law enforcement versus uh, people who work in um, um, like different areas of public service, you know, and just really trying to absorb all the, that's going on. And then it's different because there's also now the reality of me getting up, you know, at six and being ready to be ushered off into our destinations by 630 every morning. And it's, it's like a war zone. And I've never seen DC like this before. And it's, it's a beautiful war zone and that's the only way I can describe it only because everything you know of course was locked down and barricaded off and um it's not how you expect to necessarily be working as a therapist in the U.S. maybe in other countries I can understand there are times where you go in and work in very difficult situations, but you don't really expect these types of environments at working as a therapist here in the U.S. So, and I say beautiful because I'm still in awe, you know, we're still in the capital of the country and there's all these historical monuments and museums and things that I will not get to go and view, view and see, you know, there are these, these, these beautiful buildings and the architecture and, you know, um, have an opportunity to, to, you know, be in the Capitol to, to look at all the historical facts and read the history. I mean, it was just a beautiful war zone. And there were, of course, tons of National Guardsmen um, also doing service. And um, we were so thankful to have everyone around, you know, to, to be safe and, and all these things. But I'm still there to practice my craft and my 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 healing art, and that is um, trauma therapy. And it was probably the first time I've ever practiced um, trauma therapy, like counseling in the middle of an event that is te technically still taking place. Although the actual, you know, main event has already taken place, but the impact of um, still the, the consequences surrounding the event are still in play and we're still there to work and assist and support and try to unpack some of the things that people had experienced during um, these events and be um, open. So just to, you know, start in a place um the first thing I want to 
to maybe give a little bit of meaning to is when I talk about how fear was weaponized, especially over the last four years, I've always described fear as one of my three little dirty demons in the corner. And I don't know if you've, if anyone's ever been around me, you've probably heard me say that, you know, with some of my students in class, you know, and some of my uh, speaking engagements and those sort of things. I always describe the fact that there's three little dirty demons in the corner that try to convince you that what you know to be your truth isn't real. And they try to convince you in every which way um, that you are somehow you don't know yourself. And those three little demons for me have always been shame, fear, and guilt. And I always say fear is the most cunning out of all of them because fear has a level of power that convinces you to submit and, and, and step away from your own personal power. And that is fear strength. And fear in this situation, especially over the last years, the reason I use the word weaponized is because when we think about things being weaponized, it means that they've been adapted for use. They've taken something that is uh, maybe even has a different meaning, a different context, and it's been adapted for another use. And in, in this perspective, I feel like it was fear that was adapted for another use. And those uses, I think, are many. I've, I have a few here listed, but I think that there may even be many more. So from what I've seen in therapy and in mental health, the way people have, you know, the way that they've um, constructed things in their minds over the last um, four years, um, the way that they started living, the way they started making choices, the way that their conversations changed, um, I would say fear was weaponized in these ways. One, it was weaponized to control. It was very much used to control people. It was very much used to create a narrative. Fear was weaponized to confuse people. And I was so many people confused with just the basics that they should know to be true. You know, it, it's kind of like the idea of, you know, I've been driving a car my whole life and all of a sudden now I'm confused about where the, the key is for the ignition. People, fear was weaponized to change a person's beliefs. Fear was weaponized to incite violence. Fear was weaponized to divide people. And this is something that I think I will go into a little bit later, but the division that took place among people, among ethnic groups, among friends and among family, fear was definitely a part of that. And the way that it was weaponized and created and constructed and, and used, divided groups and populations of people and friends and and just just everyday normal people who would normally, you know, have coffee in the morning, right? It, it, there were these divisions that were taking place and that are still present. Fear was also used to manipulate, you know, to definitely manipulate things that we would find to be um, our normal environment, our everyday um, understandings, our our trust in things. Fear was definitely, um, and this was the this was the most interesting one. I found this to be the most most interesting one of the last four years. Fear was weaponized in the way people started questioning every single thing for no other reason except that one, if you were a patriot, you were supposed to question things. Two, I question it just because I can question it for no other reason except that I'm not going to accept whatever is said. I'm going to question everything because if I am, because I know something that other people don't know and they don't get it and they don't see it. So I need to question everything. And that's even hard for me to understand. I just saw this level of questioning things, even things that don't don't have a question, you know, like whether or not the sky is blue. You know, now all of a sudden we, we can't no longer come to a, an agreement on anything. Should we drink water? Like there, there there's some things that we don't necessarily have to intensely 
question in this way that causes harm. But all of a sudden now, every nothing, everything was on the table. Nothing was 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 not without questioning. And even if a question had an answer, the answer always needed to be questioned because the answer could possibly not be right. The next thing is miscommunication. And I think that this is something that um, everyone kind of feels, no matter what you feel politically or what you feel um, that you've seen. I, I would say there's not one person in this world, regardless of what their perspective is, doesn't feel like on some level that there's miscommunication. And I, 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 like I said, I don't care if that's, you know, you are a Republican or Democrat. I, you know, both of these groups of people do believe that miscommunication took place. But in both of these groups of people, it's because of the way fear had been weaponized over these last four years. The next thing I don't think people realize is that fear also was weaponized to humiliate people. There were there are many times and things that humiliation was used as a uh, way to um, perpetuate an idea or to put someone um, um, maybe even in cancel culture or was just used as a way to um, some ways for people to um, fear being wrong and humiliated about what they were believing. So they, they started to hold on even stronger to the belief to um, not have to go through being wrong. I hope that I've explained that in a way that communicates what, what I've seen in therapy. Um, the other thing is that fear was weaponized to tap into a legacy and an undercurrent of hate and racism in this country. We know the history of our country. We, I think, as a nation are maybe finally even starting to come to terms and grips with fear and the layers of, um, and the legacy of this in our country, hate and racism and just the undercurrent that flows. But the thing is, is that it takes on a different mentality when fear is used and weaponized to sort of ignite this undercurrent and how it bubbles and flows up um, in our everyday existence and encounters with each other. The other thing that fear did um, is that it caused more fears. And that's the other part about the weaponizing of fear and how I always consider it to be one of my three little dirty demons in the corner that just kind of hang out in people's lives and, and try to make an impact. It's because fear is never ending. Once you buy in and believe into it, it can go on and on and on with creating new fears, new fears, new understandings of fear, new imaginary fears, perceived threats or real threats. It, it's, it's never ending. And if you have a never ending idea like fear, you can weaponize it in so many different directions. But the weaponizing of fear is what also led to like the accumulation of all of that is what led to an event and what can lead to events like this. And but this one was an insurrection, an insurrection, meaning a a a an attempt to um, take over a government. That's not something, you know, that's not something we would expect to have happen in the U.S. in this day and time. But you know what? I guess we've learned something about ourselves um, as American citizens. So for me personally, because I've had two different this has impacted me in two different ways. There's two different parts of this I need to address. So the first part is DC, right? As a, as a trauma professional um, working with individuals who, um, who are impacted by the event. And the second part is personally as a human being um, who encountered secondary trauma 
just as if this was 9-11, you know, um, in some ways I kind of feel like worse than that. Um, and how, you know, what's my perspective on that? What's some understandings we can take from that? So the first part, you know, as a therapist in D.C., um, working, being called to serve and being in a profession of service um, was not unlike the individuals that I was working with. Because law enforcement is public service and it is a, a personality type that is led in, you know, somewhere within them led to um, want to protect and to serve and to be of service for their community. And the Capitol Police would be, you know, in service of their country also. Um, so, you know, walking in with um, a level of expertise in this area, you know, I'm supposed to know um all of the things to say and to do um, in events like this. The challenge being there have no, there have been no events like this in my lifetime. So guess what Tasha ran into? There wasn't a journal, a journal article I could reference. You know, uh, I can't go back to the revolutionary war and reference anything from that uh, mental health wise. Anyway, I mean, maybe some historical stuff, but, you know, there ain't like it was a therapist writing about some things after the conflict then. Um, so this was different. And so I had to pull on my knowledge, wisdom, skills, expertise. And then sometimes you had to go off of the cuff and um, do it based upon observation and what's taking place in the moment. The actual ways in which a person from a personality who provides service and who is meant to serve these people, you know, law enforcement, but people who, who serve, I would, I wouldn't say especially law enforcement, but definitely people in public service, you know, when you're trained to always be of service of people, it's sometimes very hard for you to realize that, you know, it's okay to receive support. Like it's okay to, um, to need help yourself. Um, it's it, not everything has to be um, that you can deal with it. It's okay to have some moments where you yourself as, you know, the person who's always helping other people also receives help. So, of course, that's a challenge um, when working um, with law enforcement. The other thing is, you know, there is, the, like I said, you know, the, 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 the situation um, surrounding the events had the major event had happened, but the situation and the consequences of it were still happening. And then at that point, there were some things that were still unknown. So you have this, and then the inauguration was also about to take place. And then you have this situation where there's still a high level of attention in the air. There's still a high level of, you know, not knowing in the air, you know, there's still very much, you know, day by day, things are being locked down more and more and more um, at some points to the point where, you know, um, as therapists trying to f navigate our way through barricades and and find our way back to, you know, our hotel or, you know, find food. Um, there was a very uh, intense three days, um, you know, where, you know, you we could wander around for, you know, an hour or, or more um, just trying to navigate how to, you know, get back to our location, um, you know, for sleeping and, and then also, you know, what's open to find food, you know, that was not something that we considered before we got there, that there would be those intense um, things to consider um, in a lockdown situation. Because like I said, you know, we've never experienced this as a therapist, you know, going into a crisis situation in the U.S. The individuals who are in service, um, you know, there's a buildup here that's taking place. We're, we're in pain. We, we, we're, in, we're, you know, I saw a lot of grief. There's a lot of grief that was taking place because, you know, there was a lot that was lost, you know, on that day, you know, officers, you know, lost one of their own people lost sort of like their sense of security and a uh, institutional foundation that, that upholds the safety and, and the the law in our country, you know, the capital that that is the the symbol of our democracy, you know, that represents that whole area, represents us um, 
and the security of having a democracy, like all of that was sort of, you know, pounced upon and, 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 and it showed us our vulnerabilities and it made us feel very insecure, um, you know, as a, a nation and, and, you know, as, as officers, you know, um, there was a, a feeling of hurt and a feeling of a lack of support um, because, and you guys have seen the news, you know, this isn't anything that's like not in your awareness. There was tons of people. There weren't that many, you know, Capitol Police to sort of sort this out and to stabilize this. So you have like, um, you know, you have minimal amounts of individuals to, you know, handle this violent mob of individuals who want to overthrow a presidential election. That's traumatic, you know? That's traumatic as a citizen. It's traumatic, you know, as an officer having to do your job through all of this. The other aspect about working with law enforcement that I think is, um, you know, very known is that, you know, it is recognized that, you know, law enforcement sometimes work. Um, there's a high amount of peer support that becomes um, very um, influential in how they deal with their mental health. And there can also be levels of, um, you know, not wanting to seem that you have a mental health issue or that there's also any problems because you may fear that you could, um, you know, jeopardize your um, job in some way um, by seeming mentally unstable. So um, uh, these are things to, that are always crossing my mind when working with law enforcement, because I know that these are things that sometimes are crossing um, their minds. Um, and so um, the, there is a value in, um, mental health, working with the peer support, um, law enforcement officers that were also available, um, on site along with, um, you know, working together with them to also work with the officers that, you know, needed support. There had to be a collaboration in how um, the work was taking place because of the, um, the difficulties of the situation and because the, of the tension of being in a situation where there's still all of this, um, you know, unknowing, um, uh, not knowing, um, sort of still going on. What I learned in that situation um, that I have a language for now, you know, I didn't have a word for it then, but um, what I know now is um, another therapist on site mentioned the idea of the ministry of presence. And that phrase really stuck with me. And the idea is, is that there's a, there's a power in being present. Um, there's a power and a healing that can start to take place by just being present and open and um, creating safety in who you are um, when you're working in a situation like this. Um, I think sometimes in the work that we did, it may have seemed different from when you think of the typical work that um, a trauma professional does, but it's not unheard um, of in the work that crisis does, because sometimes being out there, being seen, being present, making it known that you are available if anybody needs to talk to you, checking in on people, speaking to people when you walk in the door, smiling at people, you know, um, having a cup of coffee with people, you know, asking them about, you know, um, just, you know, how their day is doing. All of this is a part of a power of presence. And this presence takes on the tone of, you know, not only do I support you and not only, you know, do I recognize that things could be hard for you right now, but I want you to know that if there's anything that I can do for you, here I am, I am safe, I am open and available to you. And there is also no pressure to take part in um, anything that um, I may be offering, you know, I'm just here in my 
my energy is here to be present with you. And I found that to be very effective in the work that we did in this situation, because many times, um, you know, the tension of continuing to do your job to secure the capital, which is your job and and um, handle all of the different threats and things that, you know, um, people were concerned about with the buildup of the inauguration, you know, it's totally understandable that all of that's still going on. I mean, here is American people. We were hearing about it on the news every day. So imagine being in the thick of it and that being your responsibility. In that moment, I learned that, you know, as crisis counselors or even as trauma professionals, our presence and what we do can have a powerful effect on people, even if we are just there, even if they just see my face and start to know my name every day. And, you know, some of that became a lot of the work that I did is making sure that I see you every day and you see me so that you know that someone here is available for you. So as we, you know, sit and gather ourselves. um, from understanding that um, the power of what took place um, is historical and life changing. I found that, you know, once the inauguration took place, there was a, a little bit of relief, you know, and a little bit of easing of the tension. I'm not saying that it, I would, I would hesitate to say it was all downhill from here because that's truly not accurate because, you know, we still had the, the trials, you know, um, taking place, you know, in the, you know, in Congress of everything that was happening. And in the, when I say the trials, I mean the impeachment trials. Um, but the, 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 the sort of, the turning point in this was getting through the inauguration and, you know, having our newly elected president, Joe Biden, and our vice president, Kamala Harris, take office was very important um, from a healing perspective Um, because it allowed for change. And regardless of what you believe, guys, when you do trauma work, there has to be change. Progress in healing cannot be made without a change. There has to be some sort of turn, there has to be some sort of turnover of, 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 of newness that takes place or a turnover of new, of a different understanding, um, so that, that tension can be eased. And um, the, 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 I think the inauguration brought that um, to aspects of the work that we were doing with the Capitol Police because, you know, at that point, people started to open up more. People started to get comfortable with the idea of on-site, um, you know, crisis services, crisis counseling services. Um, people started to... Um, talk about the tension um, that they were feeling. People, you know, started, there started to be an ease in the environment, not just with, um, you know, the officers, but, you know, all of the people um, that were around, it was still very much business and safety and professionalism. But even in some of the ways in which, um, you know, as on the news, you could see that, um, the National Guard, some of the National Guard were being were leaving the Capitol. Some were being changed out. Um, there was a level of, OK, um, this happened. You know, um, I can get through this. Let's move forward. Let's figure out, you know, how I can heal. Let's figure out um, how I can deal with this situation. I now have time to sort of at least start to think about it because the truth of the matter is, is that I don't think that anyone who was in that situation is really going to have time to process that on any kind of level until much, many months or even a year or two from now, just given the magnitude of the situation and all the issues and things that are surrounding the events of that day. And so the second part of this is my personal experience with it, right? And going in there as a therapist who was very shocked and very hurt and had a level of secondary trauma from witnessing witnessing it on, you know, the media and on TV that is significant, you know, to then go on and put on your professional hat. Mostly, I found that once I got on site and once I saw the magnitude of what had taken place, 
and the destruction of the God, guys, the destruction of the capital. I just that was um that was mind blowing. But from that perspective, I had some anger to contend with. Didn't realize that I had some anger. I mean, anger is a natural emotion. I mean, we all think, you know, you know, we, we get angry, of course, that that's normal. But, you know, anger, there's anger is a secondary emotion. So there's always something behind it. And I think what I didn't realize until I got up there and it was very real and you're like, it's in front of your face and you can see it is hurt. It was painful and it was very hurtful to see this have taken place. It was also very painful and very hurtful to know that loss had taken place. And then I thought about loss on many different levels. First, to know that a loss took place of an officer because of this event. A death occurred. And then as you could see in the news, after the event, more death occurred with officers because of suicide. That was very impactful to me. The other losses that impacted me is I started thinking about the death of other individuals that were in the in the insurrection, that were a part of the events. And I know that may sound, you know, some people, let me just say, some people may take the perspective and say that, you know, okay, well, you were doing something wrong and if something happened to you, then you deserve it. But, you know, I don't take that perspective. Like, even as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm really trying to keep my emotions in check because the truth of the matter is, is that I don't like to see anyone lose their life over these types of events. I do believe that people can be manipulated. People can be brainwashed. <sighs> And taken advantage of. And that's very hurtful to me. Because those types of things took place. And because of that, people lost their lives. I have empathy for the families of people who lost their life over this type of foolishness. I also have empathy for the family and the friends of people who are now, you know, over the last four years had to step away from family members and friends and people they cared about because of this miscommunication, because of this brainwashing that took place in our country, because of this fear, these fear-based tactics that started to change people. People lost individuals, whether they physically lost them or whether they mentally, emotionally, or spiritually lost them. People lost people that they cared about friends and family. And as these arrests take place because of, you know, these events at the Capitol, you know, if you commit domestic terrorism, then you deserve to be punished according to the law. But I can't help but empathize with the fact that some of these people are fathers and mothers and it is their children who are suffering. It is the sisters and the brothers. These are still family members. And regardless of who you are to lose a family member or regardless of what your family member has done, doesn't mean that you don't love a family member and you have lost them because of these events. And because of the getting caught up in these levels of misunderstanding and miscommunication. That is not to say that I don't believe that people are still responsible for your own education, your own knowledge, and your own understanding of things. But that's not all of what happened in this situation. The accumulation of the events of the last four years with the way social media in other forms of, of media, the way miscommunication was spread in this country had a devastating effect on people 
and I empathize with that. I truly believe that sometimes people can be good people. Good people can make bad choices. Brainwashing played a part in that. So I think you maybe can tell that my emotions based upon that is also because of my secondary trauma. And so that's something to kind of recognize, you know, like all people in this country who were exposed to those events, we everyone was exposed to secondary trauma. And if you don't know what secondary trauma is, it is when you're not a part of the actual direct event, but you either witness the direct event you uh, you are a part of the um like the the work surrounding the healing of the direct event um or you have observations from the direct event whether you've heard about it or whether um you know someone that um was impacted by it all of that becomes secondary trauma and um you know some people would also call it vicarious trauma but it is definitely the exposure to all those things um, that are surrounding that primary event. I think one of the things that is the most disturbing about some of this is the level of how this has impacted people. Um, and people are really traumatized by this, but it's almost like either they don't acknowledge it or they don't want to acknowledge it. Or some people don't believe what happened, happened. You know, there's like so many arguments around it, you know, but it, it, at times it, I mean, some people believe that some of the things that happened may have been justified, you know, depending upon their level of understanding of the event, you know, not that, you know, any type of insurrection is going to be justified, especially what took place on the 6th. Um, I think mostly what is sometimes very disturbing is the amount of gaslighting that takes place um, when, you know, with what's going on right now. We know that an event took place. We know that it was wrong. We know that it's because of the lead up of certain, um, e certain um, messages and manipulation and propaganda and, and rhetoric in the country and, um, you know, the promotion and inciting this type of violence. And we know, we know that our former president had a hand in it. And it seems like gaslighting when you know things to be true, but you still have someone telling you that what you saw wasn't real. You know, gaslighting is when we take someone and we try to and we and we try to convince them that their own knowings, their own truth, their own experiences with their trauma, you know, or with that event didn't happen or wasn't true or um, the way that they're perceiving it or feeling about it is wrong. So gaslight, like the, another example of, of how gaslighting takes place, this takes place all the time in situations of like um, um, maybe domestic violence or situations of, you know, being in toxic relationships. You may be, you know, talking to a person, telling them, you know, I don't like the way you, you curse at me. I don't like the way you raise your voice. You're very disrespectful to me. You know, you um, are on the verge of being, you know, physically abusive with me. You pushed me the other day and you try to say that you didn't push me. Like you're, you're sitting here telling this person all of these things that you know to be true and you know to be, you know, the, 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 the onsets of different aspects of domestic violence um, and you know them to be wrong and you'll have the person turn around and tell you you're imagining that I don't raise my voice at you. I'm just a passionate person. Right. I didn't I didn't push you. I just tripped and I, I accidentally brushed into your shoulder. Right. You, you know, things to be right and you know, things um, to to be um, uh, abuse. And you have someone sitting here telling you that what you know to be true is absolutely not true, that it's interpreted a different way. That's gaslighting. And a lot of the things surrounding this event that I see taking place right now are country, like national wide versions of gaslighting. You know, I think with some of the stuff that's starting to maybe um, happen with the arrests and, um, you know, with with um, the, you know, 
being able to find people that were a part of the insurrection. Um, I think some of that is maybe at least in some respects starting to cat to, to counteract some of the gaslighting that's taking place with, with, um, with individuals. But, um, you know, it's, it's still out there, you know, we still have certain news channels that call this event something different. They don't necessarily call it an insurrection. They may call it a riot. They don't call it domestic terrorism. They, they call it, you know, um, they try to name it something else or blame it on different people. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, testimony most recently, you know, from the FBI, you know, calling it what it is, talking about the rise of, um, you know, white supremacist groups and militia groups and things here in the U.S. and the threats to our nation. And we have that, you know, coming from the FBI. And then we still have people who turn around and say that these things don't exist, that this is just divisiveness and this is not real in our country. And that is gaslighting. We know something to be real. We have it confirmed by our, you know, um, authorities who handle, who are professionals who handle this. We know it to be real, but we still have some people who will turn around and tell us that we, um, you know, that we're making it up or that we're, um, you know, overanalyzing this or that um, it doesn't exist, you know, that this country is free from you know, racism, three, free from oppression, free from all of these things. So this couldn't possibly exist. That's gaslighting. At the end of all this, coming from the perspective of someone who works with trauma, who works in as a professional in crisis, and then someone who now was um, a witness to, you know, this and has her own secondary trauma from it. You know, I'd really hope that people maybe stop and just sort of self-reflect on the impact of this last year, 2020 into 2021, this presidential election, um, you know, this pandemic. We've been under a lot of stress. We've been under a lot of different change and another type of, you know, historical type of national change has taken place and is currently taking place in um I think maybe a little self-reflection. And then if you feel like you need to grieve, grief, grief is healthy. Grief is natural. Allowing yourself a grief process. In some ways, collective grief is in order. We collectively as a nation grieve the loss that we experienced because of the events of January 6th. That loss was the security and the confidence we felt in our election process and in our capital and in our government, in our democracy, that was shaken. Anybody who goes through those levels of change, any society that goes through those levels of trauma, may be experiencing some grief collectively. Some of these things are, you know, like I said, still taking place. So, you know, I I don't have an answer in terms of how we move forward with healing. The only thing I'm left with right now, the only thing I I feel like we can pull on is maybe understanding ourselves more looking at our own challenges, our own feelings surrounding this issue, our own flaws, our own strengths, our own perspectives on humanity. I think that's where we have to start. Usually, you know, you have to start with yourself if you're going to gain an understanding or be a better person, you know, and I feel like that's where we have to start. We have to start with ourselves in this healing process. To know thyself, to have a better understanding of yourself is the first impact that you can make 
and being a better citizen of this world. So that was a lot. And I think maybe for now, this conversation has to be left right there because it's an unfinished conversation with everything that's still taking place. So I wish you much healing. I wish you a little bit of peace and understanding with each other and kindness um, and compassion with your neighbors. And most of all, give yourself a little bit of grace. This has been The Trauma Perspective with me. Dr. Tasha Browning. Thank you.